I had been abusing methamphetamine pills for the past two years or so. Things had really started to get out of control during the last few months. My relationship was falling apart and my partner asked me to leave our home until I was clean. I had nowhere to go so I took all of my belongings and drove eight hours to a friend's house. I had many misadventures along the way, but that is part of a different story. Unbeknownst to me, my friend was also a recovering stimulant addict. He also is a medical professional and a fellow psychonaut. We took LSD and shrooms together over the course of three days. Without judgment, this friend of mine showed me how to use the power of psychedelics in ways I'd never been able to achieve on my own. He gently guided me to confront my addiction issues, and by the time I left his home one week later, I had dumped my entire stash and was committed to never touching any drugs, other than weed or psychs, ever again. Or so I thought. I came home to my partner who accepted me with open arms, as long as I could stay clean. She said she had the man she fell in love with back. I started a new job a few weeks later. This is when I should have spotted the warning signs that I may have been a bit overconfident in my abilities to beat this addiction overnight. Once I got back into the daily grind, getting up at 5am and working every single day, I didn't have any cravings for stimulants, however, I was still craving something. I was smoking at least an eighth of weed a day, I started to take Kratom every day before work to get up and moving early in the morning. I would typically order my drugs online from plugs I had met over the years. I was looking for a good price and some good weed and took a chance ordering from a vendor that I was familiar with, but had not done much business with in the past. This is where everything starts to fall apart again. I got the package in the mail, and when I opened it, I was surprised to find about a quarter bag of crystal meth. I contacted the vendor who had some bullshit excuse about how he mixed up his packs and he would reship my weed. This vendor knew that I was trying to get clean off of stims and he told me I should flush the bag immediately. I should have taken his advice. Of course, I did not. My plan was to sell his bag to an acquaintance and make some extra money, so I held on to it for a few days until I could meet up with the guy and make the sale. The next morning, crawling out of bed at 5am, my old addict brain possessed me again. Might as well just have a little line before work, one last hurrah, no one will know but you, and plus you're getting rid of it all in a couple days anyway. I did a small line, felt that old familiar feeling kick in. Even while I was chopping up the line, I remember thinking to myself, this is a horrible mistake, but the addict side won. After work, I decided to redose. I cut up a fat line this time. I did not have much experience with pure crystal and was used to taking pressed pills. I'm not sure how much I actually dosed the second time, but I knew as soon as it went up my nose that it was way too much. I didn't sleep that night, but I had been overstimmed so many times. I knew that as long as I didn't redose, I'd get through the day and be able to crash the second night. No sleep came the second night either, or the third night. That is when I became concerned because the meth should have been out of my system by then. It was on the evening of the fourth day that the hallucinations began. The first thing I remember is laying on my bed and reaching for a cup of water on my nightstand. I went to grab it and my hand passed right through. The strangest confusion washed over me. I tried to grab it again, and even though I could see the cup clear as day, my hand passed through like Patrick Swayze in Ghost. I looked away and looked back, and the cup was still there. Even when I knew it was a hallucination, I could not unsee it. Then the shadow people. Creeping out of my closet in the corners of my bedroom were the outlines of these entities slowly floating toward me. They looked like they were wearing hoodies and had no faces, but they felt intelligent and I could sense nothing but pure evil emanating from them. I started getting really worried and figured I should probably go to the hospital, but this meant I had to confess to my partner. I had gone behind her back and relapsed. I had been playing it off as if I was sick up to this point, but decided I needed to confess. I told her I believed I had entered meth-induced psychosis and I might need to go to the hospital. She was very upset with me. 
We weighed the pros and cons of going to the emergency room. I didn't want to be locked up in a mental ward and knew if I was able to just fall asleep, I would wake up right as rain. My partner was so upset with me, she basically said I put myself in this situation and if I want to go to the hospital, then I can call for an ambulance myself. I should mention that I probably downplayed the severity of my psychosis as to not freak her out and to lessen the blow of having broken my promise to stay clean once again to her. I decided I would try to sleep it off one more night. This is when I truly broke away and lost all touch with the real world. I remember thinking that my friend had directed a movie that he never told me about and it was on YouTube and I decided to put it on. The plot had something to do with multiple intersecting stories of these characters trying to survive an apocalyptic event. There was some kind of huge explosion that decimated most of the earth. To my delight, my friend had based one of the characters in the film on me and another one of our friends. He also had based the character on himself. My character had called my two friends and we made plans to meet at his house and try to ride out the apocalypse together. This slowly started to change perspectives. I was no longer watching the plot unfold in a movie. I was now experiencing the movie as the character that was based on myself. I met up with one friend we can call Phil by somehow transporting to his house and then we drove to my other friend's home we can call Bob who lived in another city. When we got to his house, we entered through a side door. He lived in an attached duplex, and next to him lived an elderly black couple and their two grandchildren. We did not make any contact with them yet, but I could see everything that was unfolding in their home as well, sort of like I was switching back and forth between first person and movie mode. We decided to hunker down and smoke some weed at Bob's house. The next thing I remember, I could see the entire destroyed earth reconstruct itself. The world went from complete ruin back to normal in a matter of seconds, and there was some sense that this was a digital world like when you die in a video game and then restart at the save point. However, we didn't get to rejoin the world and we were stuck in this apocalyptic dimension, looking down over the pristine earth that went about its business as if nothing happened. All of the people who had died in the apocalypse were reset in the exact positions that they were in when the world ended and were none the wiser anything had occurred at all. This included alternate versions of ourselves that got to finish living our lives while we were trapped in this purgatory. It turns out that the family that lived next to Bob were trapped in purgatory with us as well. There is an entire subplot that is very fuzzy to me now that involved us going back to Earth and murdering our own replacements and living out their lives, but each time we did, the apocalypse would happen again and we would end up in the exact situation. After some kind of eternity, myself, Phil, Bob, and Bob's neighbors had all accepted our fates. We were trapped in purgatory in this desolate wasteland forever. Then a new plot development occurred. The old man that lived next to Bob used to be a brilliant engineer and had all sorts of blueprints and science books in his basement. He had regretted wasting his life away with drinking and had let his great mind go to waste. Additionally, Bob and the oldest daughter that lived next door ended up having children, and somehow their children had children. We had used the old man's books and blueprints to reinvent the battery. We were then able to harness electricity and use it to watch the film that I thought my friend Phil had directed, which was the delusion I was currently living out. The old man preached to his children and great-grandchildren about how they should not waste their brains and to not follow in his footsteps. Then he would tell tales of the old world and would show the film. Some time had passed and we had repopulated this desolate land with hundreds of people, but they were all deformed from inbreeding and they didn't look completely human. They resembled something like orcs from the Lord of the Rings. They turned watching Phil's movie into a sort of ritual and eventually an entire religion was built upon it. Meanwhile, the old man passed away but the youngest of his granddaughters continued to work endlessly on one of the inventions he had written a blueprint for. This device was completed and then we somehow used it to open a portal down to earth. Another device was invented that created glowing orbs that were human souls. It became our job to create all the new souls and send them down to earth. These souls knew of Phil's movie and of us and we became the gods and goddesses of a new religion for all of humanity. One of the orbs was the Messiah, and we put Jesus on Earth. 
Our intentions were always good and we hoped for peace. After thousands of years, we had finally somehow figured out how to get to heaven. We had been trapped in limbo for so long. Heaven was through some sort of portal and when you went through, you would stay there for 10,000 years and then return. The catch was that you can only go one time, but the experience was pure bliss and ecstasy. I didn't want to experience heaven without my partner and our son, so I had to wait for them to die and join me in limbo. They said when they finally came, it was magical, and I sobbed when I saw them again, and we all walked into heaven together. The next thing I remember, the movie was over, and I was very confused. I kept peeking out the blinds to see if the outside world looked normal, or if the apocalypse had actually happened. I assumed that it must have happened and that I was now in heaven with my partner as she was laying next to me. I woke her up and tried to explain to her that we were dead and to not go outside. I still don't think she understood the extent of my psychosis at that point because I could recognize her and where I was and she got up and went to work. The series of the next set of delusions are all sort of jumbled together. I'm not sure if they were happening simultaneously or if I was experiencing them in some sort of linear fashion. For a time, I was living at my father's house. He had modified his home to fit a strange new lifestyle. This involved being in constant flow with the sun. You would wake up each day and look into a mirror that reflected sunlight into your eyes for 20 seconds immediately each morning. When you slept, you would be snuggled against this strange pliable rod that would keep you in constant motion, rolling you over slowly. You would sleep every four hours for an hour. There was an alarm system that went off and played the same song when it was time to wake up. The song was by some really popular teeny bopper band that dressed up in Barney style creature costumes. When you were not sleeping, you would be outside in constant sunlight. There were activities you would do until the sleep alarm went off. Each activity involved some sort of sun ritual based exercise. At one point, I was trying to sleep on the couch that had an electric stove top inside of the cushions. I kept turning it on and burning myself and it was painful and terrifying. There was a tractor on my father's property and I took it for a joyride at night. I drove into town and stumbled upon a festival that seemed to be related to a holiday like Thanksgiving. All of the townspeople were gathered along the main street. I came across a group of police officers on a tall hill above the crowd. There was a giant pig they had on a leash. They were going to have a stuntman ride the pig down the hill and into the crowd of people. This was some kind of tradition that was held annually. I took it upon myself to hop on the pig and took it for an exhilarating joy ride. The cops found it amusing and the crowd all cheered when I made it all the way down the hill. I made a big speech into a microphone and then went back to the house. They had captured the entire thing on film and I was able to share it with my family. This is when my fiance may have returned home because she was there with me at my dad's house. She kept telling me that it wasn't my dad's house and I would be confused and it would turn back into our house for just a moment and then back to my dad's. This is when I could feel my brain start to melt. I started to lose all cognitive function and felt like an invalid. I was convinced I would have to live the rest of my life this way or until I became a vegetable. Then my brother showed up. He was using some kind of drug and had moved into my house to take care of me. I kept finding dirty needles all over the place. I didn't trust him. I then walked into my room and caught up in bed with my partner and they both had a dirty look of guilt on their faces. I had lost most of my brain by then and was aware that I was very confused. I was convinced I just walked in on my own brother with my woman and began to get very upset. My fiance was insisting it didn't happen and said she had to take me to the hospital. I thought she was lying. I wouldn't go with her. I then decided to call my mother because she would know the truth. I called and luckily she answered and told me that my partner would never do that to me and that I should trust her and go to the hospital. I remember a brief scene in the waiting room, trying to tell the person at the desk my personal information. I couldn't remember my name, my social, or what I had taken. Then I remember sitting in a chair and holding my brain in my lap. It was no longer attached to my head. 
my perspective was from my waist looking up. Then I was planning a meetup with my old friends Phil and Bob again in Disney World. There was a secret floor you can get off on an elevator there on one of the rides that no one knows about. You have to swim underwater to get there. I was in the hospital, but the hospital felt like a jail and I was laying in my bed. The hospital was also located in Disney. I would wait for my friends to get there. This room I was in had a strange familiarity, as if I had been there one time before. I was alone in a bed with a television and an old-fashioned radio. One wall was barred like a jail cell, and it was nighttime. I caught out of the corner of my eye these tiny moving people. They were my friends there to meet me, along with other people I didn't know. They had shrunk themselves, swam through an underground tunnel, and then taken an elevator into my room. They needed to get something and I helped them by letting them climb across my body. They thanked me by eating the dead skin off my arm on a recent wound that had begun to scab over. They were very happy I had helped them and then went back the way they had came. The next day they visited again, however this time they were wheeled into my room by an orderly. They stood in a circle on top of a cot holding curtains around themselves to hide. I entered the curtain to discover they were all nude. They were selling drugs and weapons. Two of them had rats that lived off of their flesh and never left their bodies, like a parasite. They would nest in their pubic hair. They thought it would be exciting to take me on their drug run through the hospital, so they all stood around my bed. This was a carefully orchestrated operation. The orderly was in on the deal when come retrieve the cot and bring it from unit to unit to sell contraband to the residents. Then I was back in my room at night again. My friend had shrunken themselves and entered my room. They gave me a potion to shrink myself and we escaped through a crack in the old fashioned radio. We took an elevator that opened into a body of water. The potion allowed us to breathe underwater, but it only lasted a short while. Under my floor, we surfaced into a secret chamber. This was a secret place where they had a huge stash of drugs hidden. We were going to take the drugs and then go on all the rides in Disney World. Then the cops showed up. We were all interviewed separately by a woman. Phil then turned out to be an officer as well and had to play it off like he was working undercover, even though he was really committing the crime with us. He then tried to interrogate Bob and I about how the drugs got there and pin it on us. We both knew that he supplied the bulk of the drugs. He finally felt so guilty that he broke down in tears and confessed. We were all arrested. At first, Bob fled the scene, but they caught him. They put us in three rooms in the top of a building. I kept walking into the wrong room every time I wanted to use the restroom and was reprimanded. They kept saying, nope, that's not your room. It's this one right here. Phil and I slept the whole time, however, Bob lost his shit. It turned out he had a mental disability and started screaming nonsense and crying like a baby. I thought it might have been some sort of defense mechanism to deny what was happening around him. I remember being envious that he was able to escape reality and the complete horror when realizing the situation I had gotten into. Drug charges, prison, armed guards. I slept and slept and then I ate a meal and slept more. Then I wake up and they tell me I'm going home. I am in a hospital. I'm on the phone with my partner and she will be here in a few minutes. I check out of the hospital with a discharge sheet reading psychosis, unspecified type, and to make an appointment with my PCP within three days. I was so confused for the first couple of weeks. Writing this has been extremely therapeutic for me. In reality, I was only out of the hospital in psychosis for about five hours and then spent the next four days in a hospital bed. None of that happened. I was a lunatic, ranting and raving to myself. I am able to find some strength in my mental fortitude. I know that was a delusion. It is feeling more and more like a dream each day that passes. I have been extremely humbled. This experience has changed me forever. I value my sanity and my mental health so much more now. I am dedicated to finally dealing with my addiction issues and treating my mental and physical health like a temple. Please let this be a warning sign. 
Meth is a terrible drug, and stimulants in general are playing with fire for anyone with an addictive personality type. My advice is to just stay away. I know I will never touch it again.